I would like to talk about um, the, the next steps further, further away from, from here, and what the, how the digitalization will help us to get a grip on this transition to a circular built environment, circular economy, construction in general. Um, obviously, it, will, it is not easy to go from linear economy as we still know it and as we still live it uh, to a circular economy. And that will, I'm sure you all understand, so already require really fundamental changes of uh, whole system that we are um, that, that we are living in. Um, and especially, it will change very much the attitude part and, and our perception of the uh, forms of buildings, cities, and, and products in general, and how they can become more um, uh, contribute better. To our security of the resources that we are using um, today. So, yes, this is my direction. So, we are talking about the transition, we are talking about the new methods that will help us to uh, unlock the value of materials to couple uh, multiple lives, uh, life cycles of materials and buildings. And that uh, has great impact on the way how we are going to design, how we are designing already our buildings and cities and, and products, uh, products as well. So, what I'm going to address today, I will be talking about decoding. Uh, circular capacity of buildings and, uh, and materials. Um, and I want to do that um, also following the developments of a lab for circular buildings uh, in, in the Netherlands, being a strong building lab, which is set up as a dynamic structure being trained once a year. And we use this as a test site to understand better how buildings can be designed uh, and transformed without. Uh, damaging uh, materials through the transformation process and um, uh, materials using, using materials through uh, different um, uh, use scenarios in a new life. What we see here are a couple of phases of development of the lab. In uh, four weeks' time, the, the lab will change again and we get uh, four circular models from the first floor. The last slide gives us an uh, um, idea of how the last phase might look like as we have agreed that this, this might change as we are every year uh, considering new developments and uh, discussing with the construction industry uh, where to go and uh, which uh, technology to push uh, forward. Um, but this lab has two pillars and has this demonstration part which uh, helps us understand that and how we design and build circular buildings, and it has also the scientific um, uh, part in itself, which is testing um, the assessment models, which will help us to understand the performance of circular buildings and how we can manage and steer materials through the um, built environment in a constrained manner. And in order to go further with my presentation, um, I'll start with this one. I don't know if maybe some of you have seen this is some slides. Well, maybe not. Um, but in order to decode circular uh, capacity of buildings, we need to understand what are we talking about, what a circular building is. Um, circular building basically um, is, we could define it as a reversible building, uh, a structure which can change uh, its function uh, and form without demolition, and which can also exchange parts and systems without uh, damaging them so that they can be used again. So the, the idea is to have a high level reuse on building level, but also on system and on material level. So we are talking about three levels of uh, transformation that becomes very important for the design and engineering tables um, from now on. 
Um, and I can define this very a long time ago. I think students from 2006 that were very few adults have seen these slides. Uh, really then, these, these methodologies have been adopted by the European Commission also as a part of our transition to red circle building design. You can find them also in the uh, design guidelines of my college for the European uh, Commission. So, we are talking about the three uh, dimensions of reversibility of buildings, spatial uh, reversibility, which has to enable buildings to stay longer without demolition. That would be the aim, basically. I, I call circular buildings reversible monuments, flexible monuments. We don't want to build for demolition anymore, um, but for long use. Uh, and I, maybe it sounds strange here because, from the um, European perspective, in the Netherlands, buildings are still being designed for 25, 30 years and are being demolished, and new ones are built. Uh, here, things are being slightly different. Um, I don't know exactly, but anyway, that's the case. Second dimension of reversibility is to uh, reconfigure, uh, have a capacity to reconfigure systems and components so they can be adapted to different functionalities and, um, and structures. And the third one is material reversibility so they can be separated and um, up upside in the uh, in future. Altogether, these three dimensions form the core of what circular building is and how we can understand how to design and assess that, um, having two pillars, adaptation, adaptability uh, of the building and structure and the reuse of the building and structure, both supported by um, design for this assembly. Um, so once we can understand how to uh, assess design, practical reversibility of buildings with design, components and materials so that they can be uh, recovered without damage um, and how we can uh, design and assess uh, spatial reversibility of buildings, we can have better understanding of circularity profile of the building. And that's what brought me to this color, color theme here, which defines circularity profiles of buildings so that we can label all buildings according to their circularity. The, the colors represent the um, high level of uh, circularity, meaning that they have high transformation capacity and high use potential, uh, which would be green ones, and the red one that would be one which cannot be adopted for future use and will end up in a downsizing of materials. So by assessing, and I'm moving very fast, maybe now for towards the assessment methods, methods that I will be talking about, that is how to understand the performance of our design solutions and buildings as built, and that they are very much related to assessing adaptability and transformation capacity of buildings, and to assess the reuse capacity of buildings or reuse potential of materials in buildings. <clears throat> By doing that, assessing these two indicators of circularity, they can just uh, label each structure and each, uh, uh, each building according to their circularity. Profile. And of course, as I mentioned in the beginning, this requires a big uh, transformation systemic change. Um, and change is definitely uh, fundamentally the way that we have been perceiving and designing buildings. And that's why I also ended up more time ago with this uh, reversible building design toolkit, which consists on one hand side the uh, assessment tools helping us to assess the transformation uh, capacity of building. Um, and uh, use potential of the structures, but also provides guidelines, which I mentioned, also being published by the European Commission. Um, so I'll go very fast because this is a fast speaking conference, just to test a few of these tools. Um, and of course, we can have a discussion later on for any questions. Talking about transformation capacity, how to understand that the building has the ability to be adopted and change of function. We can also really understand that there are different types of transformation when looking at the building. I am here to find three. We can talk about one functional, <coughs> sorry, one functional transformation. As you can see here, we can have a space or, or a structure which can accommodate um, one typology of offices, but this typology can change, so, or one typology of housing, but the typology of housing can change within the same function, some changes can take place without an ambition. Uh, transfunctional um, uh, transformation requires uh, things that we can change 
uh, space from one function to another office to building or other way around. Or uh, multi-dimensional transformation, which is kind of uh, open transformation, um, unable to so to extend building to talk, um, add on parts um, and, and so forth. To assess transformation capacity then, and whether this space and structure, I want this space and structure as we have built as building where we are here um, as well. Um, what is what is the capacity for transformation of these structures? We need to understand the dimensional part in relation to the technology of building. Um, we need to understand the a position of the core elements, which are fixed parts, is interplay between fixed and variable uh, the parts of the building and what their capacity are, are for the future. We need to understand the disassembly potential and um, dispensability and separation between main building functions. Um, and the capacity of the of the load bearing structure to carry different loads and the capacity of installation course to be adopted uh, and add on new installation services. Um, so that adds on assessment of all these four indicators and 15 sub indicators into two, which is called transformation capacity tool, which uh, just measures what you can do with building and identifies how easy it can be uh, adopted without uh, without demolition. The other one uh, which looks zooms into the physical part and configuration of the structure of the building goes into the reach potential. Um, and basically this tool is assessing the use, um, how easy elements can be taken out of the structure without uh, damaging them and looks into all dependencies as materials have with each with each other for functional, technical and physical. Uh, physical ones. Um, this um, this tool has number of indicators to, to go through and to look at, um, starting from understanding the dependencies and number of relations that the elements have, how complex the structures are, and how easy they can be uh, reconfigured. Um, what, what kind of intermediates and connections in between the, the parts are so they can be independently exchanged. The assembly and disassembly sequences of the uh, parts uh, enabled by the geometry of the connections. Um, understanding this as the steps for the construction companies so they can take out parts without demolition, different types of connections, which I'm sure you probably have seen some of these. And all these in total eight indicators and 15 sub indicators help us understand the reuse potential and the use options. Of each material in the um, in the building and ends up with a reuse potential score, which is indicating actually how short or long the feedback loops of materials are to bring them back into the use again. So this is the tool which um, is integrated into a digital tool, reversible BIM tool, which basically does all these assessments but digitally and. Um, Uses also for the existing buildings, using the use of the scan, scan files, with the scanning, and then the virtual bin is being created, which analyzes the relations of all elements within, uh, within the building to their um, assembly uh, and disassembly steps. And these assessments result in uh, reversibility ID cards per element. Um, indicating how many steps are needed to take the part out, what is everybody's CO2, which can be saved, and everybody the technologies um, that can be saved, um, and what is the new strategy of individual parts in this uh, in, in a particular building. Uh, listing just all materials and their use options uh, and um, avoided carbon technologies associated with that. And of course, provides a high level of information how much the materials can be directly reused. Um, how much of these materials can be used by reparation or by recycling, and that's also equivalent uh, to CO2, uh, CO2 savings. The parts which have a high use potential in this digital assessment um, are then selected for um, BIM object library, a library which then architects use to design new buildings. There's, there's a digital library which comes out of this digital thing, and this is actually done with the Janssen company for these parts, uh, um, these profiles I just mentioned in the previous slide, where we looked into potential reuse profiles coming from a Roman museum in the Netherlands, 
and they figured out that these profiles in the seventies are so strong, and the Janssen said themselves, we can take one profile, one will say that one profile and uh, bring back two because also the um, add on uh, a cover of the profile was strong enough to serve as a steel profile for the Poseidon scan. So this is a tool which is integrated into the digital reconstruction platform. Um, that's a platform which tries to understand the capacity of the existing buildings to be disassembled and uh, recovered and materials recovered using the uh, digital tools of scanning, reversible beam, uh, creating a material list of materials which have high use potential, and uh, in the end, um, with blockchain technology connecting materials with sales platforms. And again, used to uh, understand the circularity profile of buildings and what we can do with the buildings and the capacity of the existing buildings and also design solutions uh, on different buildings. So there, those are some examples of buildings in Luxembourg, France, uh, Belgium, and the Netherlands, uh, trying to uh, understand better how they perform. Uh, Birgul and the uh for the opportunity to share our steps towards uh, uh, towards uh, accelerating um, the circular and digital transformation so we are uh, we are uh, uh, mia and myself are presenting are, are here now in london still very dark uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for the uh, presentation uh, just now, uh, w uh, what uh, I, I want to start by uh, uh, playing a um, video. Now we are going to check whether the audio is going to play. Can, can you hear uh, the audio?
Thank you. So we uh, we hear that there is uh, a, in industry uh, there is alignment with uh, what we heard from uh, um, from our colleagues uh, in uh, what uh, you know how we we want to get the uh, I mean what we want to achieve. Now what we are going to uh, I'm going to spend the next five minutes before passing on the word to Mia is uh, on building efficiently. So I run a program inside a global program inside the company uh, on the future of design. Uh, this uh, in order to uh, achieve uh, a sustainable development towards net zero and beyond. Uh, um, what we need to do is we need to work both at the design level, in, uh, at, the, at the construction and the operations. We can't afford, uh, so uh, we, we have to, we work in a scenario, what we were looking at, and here is really trying to address the question of the of the symposium, uh, is we, we describe the, the scenarios in which we are working on from a business as usual, where we have a, a, a low uh, construction demand and uh, a, 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 a no basically very, very little or no sustainable development requirement to a future in which we uh, are, have a high construction demand and high requirements uh, uh, if uh, if we were uh, if we didn't uh, expect a high demand we would already know how to do uh, how to work uh, uh, how you know what what is the future of circular um, construction and that is the future that we inherited uh, uh, before the industrial revolution so we were using site one materials we were assembling with the uh, local skills we were uh, building uh, in uh, a low quantity the challenge is uh, how do we uh, take that to a high demand and in order to scale it what we we, are, we want to harness the power of uh, uh, data driven um, we are uh, uh, the the current trajectory is the blue trajectory in this slide what we uh, see and so we are going from uh, uh, we are basically simplifying to scale uh, the lego metaphor and that is kind of the official future of construction. And then once we have achieved that, we can then uh, uh, use digital, uh, which will uh, is uh, coming anyhow in all other industries in order to transition to uh, uh, improve uh, the over-designed, over-engineered, uh, um, uh, over-resourced uh, constructions on the top left and and uh, arrive uh, to a, a future in which we have optimized uh, structures that are uh, uh, demountable and uh, 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 we are able to repurpose uh, 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 of which we are able to repurpose the component. The, the critical thing is to... Um, to the what we what we want to do in terms of accelerating is to jump directly from the business as usual to uh, the mass customization uh we're using um using digital to uh, to get there the colors are actually uh they were client brand colors so we uh, let you the uh, uh guess what uh, uh, who we were working with in order to um in order to try and, and influence them to go in this direction uh, uh, i want to this uh, in this next couple of minutes with a few examples that i brought uh, to debunk some uh, of the myths so it looks like uh, if you have standard uh, uh, designs you you can actually uh, uh, demount them and remount them uh, better. Uh, we uh, we uh, we are uh, we want to replace that with uh, uh, still striving for a, a, an optimal uh, uh, bespoke solution, uh, and then they use the uh, or. Uh, Harness the power of uh, of digital in handling complexity in order to um, to be able to uh, reuse uh, uh, these um, these designs, uh, and we are uh, also uh, uh, you know trying to debunk the idea that uh, um, 
data-driven construction has to be done uh, off-site in factories uh, uh, with uh, by using the intelligence of uh, the machines uh, in order to work on site. And finally, we want to remove the uh, the stainless steel effectively, high uh, high. Uh, 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 you know, high impact and zero maintenance with a, a, a approach that is uh, uh, low impact, high maintenance. And there we want to see the machines that monitor the conditions because at scale, we can't imagine uh, humans to do it and the machines that uh, will intervene and repair. Uh, so I skipped, uh, uh, we focused on, uh, on construction uh, and uh, I skipped uh, what, what uh, I'm going to skip. What are the techniques uh, and the implications that, that uh, we we have a, a, an increasing number of techniques that are uh, demonstrated in uh, universities, uh, TU Delft uh, and the Netherlands, generally Switzerland uh, and all over the world are the the hotspots uh, for that. Uh, the implications are quite simple. We see this uh, generally we get 70 or 80 percent less resources in order to achieve the same uh, span of uh, ceilings with a vaulted uh, complex uh, solution. And I'm just going to share the actions that Arup is, uh, as a company is taking in order to uh, to get there. We have three types of actions and then I'm going to pass on the word to Mia. Uh, the, we have uh, the, some, the, the, the exploratory events here are some of the events that we held in the past few years. Uh, we haven't come to, to Istanbul, but uh, these are basically events like today that uh, Birgul and the team have organized, and they are impo important in order to, um, uh, you know, in, in order to, um, uh, to, to open their eyes of what is possible. Uh, I'm going to move on to sprints. Sprints is, uh, is the, what, the, what we call uh, this uh, idea. Uh, we, we, we looked at, analyzed the projects that have achieved, uh, a, uh, have made use of data-driven methods of construction. I think a couple of years back, I presented the, the, our projects on Sagrada Familia, for example. <laughs> There we remove the uh, trades uh, altogether, the the standard steel trades uh, altogether, and use the the ability of complex uh, uh, rendering complex uh, uh, designs uh, with uh, with data driven uh, construction. In that case of stone, uh, so um, how do we get uh, more of this? Uh, uh, Excellent projects on to Arup is uh, is now around twenty thousand staff and runs uh, some thirty five thousand projects uh, across the world. So how can we get uh, from uh, a handful of these projects to uh, you know a, a, some sort of a mini meaningful percentage of our projects uh, uh, to adopt data driven methods? And so that the way we do it is we uh, we just uh, uh, spark the 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 que and ask the teams to answer the question can i use an alternative method of construction so here we have a, a couple of examples um uh, glass blocks facades is uh, uh, used uh, uh, and uh, uh, loved by architects throughout the world uh, when we get to a uh, to a, 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 a you know a, a certain uh, life of the building we uh, we need to do uh, remediation work so what is the solution well one solution which is the traditional solution is to remove the facade and uh, uh, redress uh, the uh, the the building with the uh, um, in order to maybe ad address the, the the failure of uh, uh, only a small percentage of uh, uh, boxes, can we actually uh, use a, a, a what uh, in Japan is uh, an approach that in Japan is called kintsugi? Many of you will know, which is this idea of highlighting the the failure of uh, some of the components. Uh, uh, in this case, it is the failure of uh, cracks on in pots that are fixed with gold. Can we do that by uh, uh, scanning the, 
the failed uh, glass blo block and then uh, bespoke 3D printed. Re uh, and this will improve uh, uh, enormously the the impact the car the embodied carbon because we will be replacing a small percentage of the pieces uh, it will also uh, improve uh, you know send a message that we are actually uh, retaining uh, all of the um, all of the facade that is not damaged uh, and can we do that across all our projects where the failure is always limited um Another uh, another uh, uh, example is uh, this is a, a, a good example of uh, simplify to scale. Let's build the tetrapods. I mean, breakwaters is a, a nice uh, uh, area of business. The rising sea levels brings a great demand for uh, uh, breakwaters. Uh, these breakwaters uses an enormous amount of, of embodied carbon uh, uh, and. Uh, can we uh, the the beauty of these uh, tetrapods is that you can uh, throw them so to speak uh, in the, on the, along the the breakwater and they self arrange in a very uh, porous way in order to and they work very well to absorb uh, the the power of waters can we uh, use uh, uh, autonomous rock placement uh, and uh, and the digital uh, uh, sort of unpacked um, solution in order to um, in order to achieve the same uh, and then finally the uh, in our uh, this is working with our colleagues in uh, um, in the Netherlands can we achieve uh, uh, you know we have kilometers of noise barriers we have different materials can we work with with the uh, uh, robotically shot earth. Uh, again, a material that is uh, uh, needs uh, monitoring and needs uh, uh, um, uh, re uh, uh, f remediation throughout its life. Can we use the uh, the power of uh, computation in order to actually have a, a noise barrier that has a fraction of the embodied carbon? So. Uh, last uh, the the last example is uh, open innovation challenges so can we challenge the industry uh, and i am uh, going to uh, leave uh, i'm going to share this slides so you can find the story by our colleague Graham dot in uh, on mashable uh, this is uh, the idea is that when we replace uh, the glass facades currently we are re recycling uh, 40% of the glass because the rest is dirty and full of goo can we use the precision of robotics uh, uh, in order to remove the goo and uh, repurpose the glass panes of the insulated glass units as opposed to recycle 40 percent and uh, and put that into the system and uh, finally uh, uh, we uh, can we work uh, uh, you know the the we have techniques uh, to slow down uh, uh, water runoffs and uh, can we use uh, these techniques rely on high uh, skills? Can we use uh, um, the machines in order to uh, augment uh, the local people's skills in order to uh, to uh, address that? Again, here we have a link to the to the video, and uh, um, and I I. Uh, I now move on to uh, pass on the word to Mia. Uh, Mia is a, 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 a amazing colleague that uh, has uh, moved a step further. So moving from projects um, and solutions on projects to actually uh, developing uh, products uh, and uh, computational products that, that are uh, uh, going to help us uh, go towards that direction. Um, uh, Mia is a, a graduate of architecture with a master at the UCL Bartlett. She's also an award-winning um, uh, designer uh, 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 globally uh, with uh, her uh, amazing uh, achievement at, uh, at the MIT 35 under 35. Thank you, Mia. Over to you. And I'm going to uh, move on to the your first slide. Thank you, Alvise. I'm not sure if uh, you can hear me and I'm quite conscious of time, so I'll keep this uh, very short. Um, so the uh, angle that I would like to take to this presentation is more of a reflection on the role of a designer in the fight towards uh, sustainable thinking. So I decided to highlight uh, a little bit my pivotal career moments 
So you can see here in the timeline that um, I've decided to slightly shift the narrative of uh, not just graduating um, as an architect and becoming a designer, but really just uh, using these experiences in uh, digital uh, and emerging technologies. So you can see that I've done a lot of training in computational design, but also uh, design technology. And uh, in a way, my experiences have led me to uh, take on more and more technological roles rather than designer roles. Um, so really the point that I would like to do here to make is um, asking the question of how designers are moving beyond designing to uh, develop products to enable design. So um, I think my personal statement is that I recognize that the world does not need uh, more buildings. It needs um, more efficient buildings um, and also re recognizing the skills gap in um, digital transformation. So. Uh, how can we then start to uh, equip ourselves with powerful tools and skills and become the people who actually not design just buildings, but uh, create and build products that are going to help and enable those designs. Um, so you can see here in my experiences that I uh, shifted after uh, having obtained my license in architecture towards uh, learning more about smart cities, urban analytics, and really taking on these um, data literate uh, courses and um, uh, experiences. Um, and really what I wanted to highlight uh, is even though I had my first startup experience working as a product implementation manager, working alongside product and customer success teams, um, really uh, closely and with international AEC clients on the implementation of uh, BIM and digital construction projects of all size um, before joining Arab as a senior product manager, uh, looking at uh, really uh, strategically uh, leading the development, the commercial and technical development of geospatial insights. Um, I wanted to stress and talk about specifically uh, one project or one pivotal project, uh, which had uh, in a way shifted that transition as well and accelerated it. Um, it's the project which um, I uh, led me to get this award um, with the MIT Technology Review. Um, next slide, please. It's, um, it's about eliminating construction waste using AI. So the idea was that that was a consortium of partners. Um, it was a UK research and innovation demonstrator project where uh, we brought in different partners coming from academia, SMEs, and um, uh, other companies to really address this question, which is, can real-time data analytics and mixed reality visualizations help deliver construction projects, managing risks, and reducing waste, not just on time and budget? Um, and so this is uh, the, the answer that I would like to give you here with this specific concrete example. Um, also asking the question and reiterating on uh, the fact uh, that uh, we ask ourselves, can a designer upskill themselves and play a role, a different role to accelerate circularity and transform how projects are delivered in the built environment? Um, next slide, please. So really what we're talking about here is an example of how we could build more efficiently and build for the long-term value. Uh, next slide, please. So with AI, what I've done is I've developed this algorithm, um, which is uh, which aims at recognizing uh, floor constructions to be able to compare the as-built versus the actual. So you can see on the right-hand side uh, how we have estimated the number of floors, um, and we have compared that against uh, the BIM model. Uh, we have then um, overlapped this and recreated a timeline to really address specifically and guess and predict um, ahead of time using this classification model whether um, we are uh, ahead or behind the schedule. And so in a way, uh, from designing to becoming more of a leader in the development of suitable computational products that seek to address different ESG problems, uh, in this case, a bit more uh, around circularity and long-term sustainable goals towards pre precision construction and waste elimination. So in a way, um, this kind of AI problem or AI solution uh, helped us 
explore the uh, adoption of these deep learning techniques for more accurate progress monitoring for construction works on the job site. And so as such, what we're able to do is we can um, apply some principles of circularity, not just to the physical assets uh, when we look at the actual construction, but also at the digital construction assets um, and the digital technology with re highly reproducible AI models that are readily adaptable to new projects, new geographies, new programs. Um, in a way, we can use this uh, highly computational algorithm uh, to um, and re-implement it on different projects of all sizes. And we can retrain, uh, of course, if we have the right data, the right label training data, we can reproduce and retrain that model to recognize uh, where there are faults, where there are um, gaps in that construction monitoring, so we can work towards waste elimination and deliver better projects um, on site. Um, and in a way, so we address this uh, and enable the value creation and performance improvement with actionable insights in digital construction. And that is all uh, for me today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mia. Uh, so you've seen uh, how four different uh, ways in which a big company is uh, trying to uh, transform uh, the industry. Obviously, we can't do this by ourselves. You so uh, and uh, we work. You know, we need to work, of course, with our clients and contractors. But uh, we also need uh, to work with the university, which makes me very happy. And uh, the, we desperately need from the university the demonstrators of the techniques that will. Uh, take us there so looking forward to the rest of the conference and thank you um, thank you to some technical university colleagues for inviting me and it was extremely important conference mm -hmm. i'm an academic staying in europe to delve into real circular projects in real life so um i have quite an experience uh from a different lifestyle but this year uh both in la and in Istanbul. Um, I thought uh, I should probably uh, put everyone's mind the carbon issue because uh, as we talk about circularity, uh, it becomes an extremely important topic. And carbon is not always a bad, you know, a bad thing. But um, right now we're all after uh, removing it and moving it, and every project we uh, get involved. As we know, uh, carbon emissions are major contributions to climate change, and this is besides why industry organizations and companies around the world are setting carbon production and net zero goals. Here in this chart, the first three steps where I work, and this is where when designers and construction people are doing their work, they get involved and tell them what to do and what not to do in order to build a sustainable uh, building. There are two ways categorizing the greenhouse emissions associated with buildings. Today, my topic will focus on buildings, but of course, you can take this to infrastructure mode too. Operational carbon, the emissions associated with energy used to operate a building, and we have been working on this a lot. And we are so successful now with lowering operational carbon. The last 20 years, a lot of research focused on energy efficiency, you know, facade design, etc. But embodied carbon is really the top of the town since the Paris uh, Agreement from 2015. Uh, carbon dioxide emissions result from production, transportation, construction, maintenance, and applied processes of building materials is gaining more importance. It's one of the two key sources of carbon from a building's overall life cycle carbon footprint, the other being operational carbon. In order to prevent global temperatures from exceeding one and a half uh, centigrade degrees, global greenhouse gas emissions must decline about 45% from 2010 levels by uh, 2030 uh, and reach to net zero by 2050. That's why whatever we're doing, we should have 2030 and 2050 goals when it comes to carbon. We have to tackle embodied carbon, which encompasses the greenhouse gas emissions associated uh, with materials over the full life cycle of, uh, of the buildings. And why should I care about embodied carbon? Should be on every architect's plate from now on when designing. 
The scale of influence is also very important because it requires uh, all supply chain uh, consultants, all supply chain uh, manufacturers uh, to get involved with the same issue. And this equation is as important as being good and being square to me. You know, and my carbon plus operational carbon is a good total whole life carbon. You should all be talking about whole life carbon uh, during design process. And when does carbon show up in buildings for those who don't work with buildings? Uh, almost 28% comes from building operations and 11% comes from materials and other building materials, uh, which is embodied carbon. So uh, when carbon emissions generated today, including the embodied carbon of buildings, will contribute to increasing effects of climate change uh, down the road, including extreme temperatures, more severe weather events, loss of biodiversity, impacts to our systems and increased droughts. Uh, this is from uh, a real life project in India, how embodied carbon is, uh, is you know, made up in a, in a project. Uh, lots of materials contribute to it. And as you see the portion of it during the life cycle of the energy of the building, and the percentages are quite alarming. Uh, and for a typical office building, Around 10 to 15 percent of energy use is from embodied energy. The indicator used to measure materials efficiency is embodied energy, which is primary energy demand for um, its production. The cost of those circular economy, everyone here knows about it, but Ellen MacArthur Foundation was leading the efforts and value finite resources and control their stocks and material flows. Dematerialize value, use renewable raw materials, replace finite resources, and recover used uh, resources. Improve raw materials yields by closing cycles while always maintaining the highest possible value of raw materials and ensure the effectiveness of the system through consistent consideration of external externalities. I just wanted to remind everyone about the fundamentals. And we need to really uh, go into recycling materials, reusing materials, retain existing assets, and be resilient by this. Priority ID to retain them through retrofit or refurbishment. A retrofit or refurbishment can be uh, if you put a lot of materials, if you increase the people, of them, uh, you can, you are probably, probably increasing the amount of product. So during uh, the blended processes, we have to be very careful about uh, doing refurbishment and retrofit uh, with the goal of reducing the environment. So providing resilience for future by enabling them flexibility and adaptability, uh, the lifespan of the asset and building elements, uh, those designed for <coughs> this assembly should be considered uh, from the very beginning. The sustainability standards are getting more and more important. We always talk about lead and brand, a lot of people don't like the idea, but that's what we need to accomplish. They are not perfect, but they are really helping us with uh, setting metrics and goals. Many global NGOs have set a goal for all the buildings, net zero operational carbon and a 40% reduction in and environmental carbon by 2030. The reason I took up the yield is to work on two projects. One aiming to get a circularity index to be more successful because uh, getting data in Turkey is extremely important. And if it's not done in the beginning stage, uh, it's impossible. So the project is completed as we share. I'm going to learn more about it finally. And the other one is going to become carbon positive and it was designed already, but finally became an issue. So, is, yeah, we're thinkers, we're able to do everything, but there are hurdles to overcome in real life. So, the science based target initiative, which aims to help companies set climate targets and transition to a low carbon economy, has recently released guidelines for the building sector, including emphasis on reducing and mining carbon emissions. So, and government incentives globally are increasing for environmental carbon emissions. That's why NGOs really has to push our ministries for the same mentality. 
And look at all the environmental crimes and all the policies and the law, they are really accepted by some countries, and Canada is really leading the way. Uh, an example would be uh, requiring uh, government projects to provide environmental product declaration reporting and global reporting potential limits for COVID 19 as well. And COVID is becoming an extremely important criteria when it comes to environmental carbon and how to target why. Reducing environmental carbon is a crucial component of both developing sustainable and low carbon buildings. And these buildings are even more marketable to their customers and investors. Uh, reducing construction and operation costs by optimizing the structure, reducing the quantities of high emitting materials used, reusing building materials, selecting more sustainable global carbon materials, and sourcing building materials globally are, um, are the items that we always go over during the integrated design stage. And calculating and body carbon is also becoming a big issue. There are a lot of softwares now, uh, but um, a whole building life cycle assessment looks at the quantities of materials and products used and their associated climate impact from sourcing through construction and use space and end of life disposal to estimate the total environmental carbon of building design. That's why all this thin uh, work uh, is getting extremely important. And this helps create a baseline system that, that can be used to identify and inform production measures. LCAs are helpful for examining different strategies and the effects they will have on reducing and binding carbon. For instance, once you set up the baseline, further assessment can detail the impact of reducing underground parking, optimizing the building structure, or selecting different building materials on the project's total and binding carbon. Underground parking, even though in green building certification system, we really want to push for it, requires a lot of concrete engineering. And Testing concrete a little bit, the mixes help us a lot with environmental carbon. That's why concrete research on this area is uh, tremendously improving. When we look at the life cycle assessment tool for circular and sustainable building, you know, uh, everyone has to put this on the wall. From, uh, that's what I say. Uh, environmental product declarations are becoming extremely important. And LCD is made up of individual EPDs. This is the sample EPD from a floor product. But that is also something you know you need to be aware of when designing and selecting products as uh, architects, especially. Retrofit. Retrofits are increasing globally from UK to Ireland, from Turkey to the US. But there are a lot of issues, problems with retrofits. Uh, buildings are insulated, triple glazing is installed, the building automation is mostly renewed, uh, and that's exactly where we need to be watching out the environmental carbon issue. Uh, we have to design for material efficiency, we have to build with lower carbon materials and minimize underground parking. This is why I said concrete, because you know when you maximize underground parking, you're using a lot of concrete. And key process elements of environmental carbon is materials inventory. That's where we're having problems too. When petrifying, based on LC and hotspot review, carbon reduction based soil design, alternatives quantification, low environmental carbon materials procurement, that's a new language for Turkey again, carbon offset procurement. And this is from a project that I'm currently working on. Uh, environmental carbon reductions are generally reducing carbon and primary materials, disclosing production strategies, and offsetting sequestering materials of or carbon offsets. Uh, this is for new materials. And uh, for materials alternative, you know, carbon sequestering is being used a lot for material reduction, uh, general lean design, building and material materials, and for product alternatives, recycled content is becoming a big issue, sustainable harvesting and local sourcing. Unfortunately, we don't have FSC certified, uh, you know, food produced in Turkey, even though we talk about a lot, you know, it's not available. And uh, about carbon reduction for interior, uh, materials, so interior designers are also big players in lowering and buying carbon, carpets, ceiling tiles, chips of course. Now, we have to select them really carefully. 
And this living building certification that I'm working on, the project and the living building certification, the first one, uh, they ask for 20% reduction in foundations, retaining walls, footings, structures, slats, framing, reinforcement, and inclusion of cladding, penetration, insulation, roofing, etc. And each of the design has never been so important as it is now. Design for sustainability and design for regenerating the biosphere and circular uh, technosphere by putting all these project requirements and bases of design together and having low shadows in the beginning of the project. Okay, don't be shy about asking to spend more time with your team, brainstorming few things, talking to clients, because when it happens on the way, it's too late. So more people. We have made that aware that your project will have a lower and larger carbon selected area. And this is from an ambition project. The influence uh, in the quantity of material and the material emission factor during design and construction is the key to success. Again, at the very beginning. And I don't think I have too much time, but uh, you know, I put them uh, during the phase of uh, a project where you talk about environmental carbon, then you are aware of environmental carbon. And we have stages, you know, UK does it, does it quite well. When you follow river stages, there are incredible, uh, you know, work done by UK, GDC and other organizations. And ESG, of course, reporting on very large carbon issues, so clarity strategies implemented and new business models are utilized. Don't be shy with ESG, talk about it. Climate change is creating an other proportion exactly actually. People we take the ambassadors see climate change not only as a threat, but also as an opportunity. They have invested $31 billion into climate mutual funds and exchange traded funds by the end of 2021, a 45% increase uh, from roughly $22 billion the year prior, according to the World Economic Report. And now, uh, all embodied carbon and ESG are on the plate of investors and we must not be black because I'm an old architect. <laughs> so if you have any questions, find me. I can see them on the little screen. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having me over, so to say. Um, I would like to talk uh, in a very short presentation about uh, two ways to close material loops in construction. Uh, one way through material exchange platforms and the other way through BIM-based cooperation between demolition companies and architects. And uh, both are very important, uh, of course, we, because we want to reuse our reclaimed materials as much as possible to reduce the environmental hazards of having to produce new materials and also to uh, uh, prevent having more waste. And so basically what we want to do is to have no more downcycling of construction materials. Like in this case, bricks often end up as gravel on the tennis courts, which is nice for the tennis players. But uh, ideally, we want to use the bricks at the same value level, so reuse them in construction projects. Now, digital technologies can help a lot in uh, making this possible. And one thing that is often talked about is the creation of material exchange platforms. Uh, these are very helpful in creating marketplaces for, uh, for reclaimed construction materials. And on this slide, you just see two examples. Uh, on your uh, left side, you see a so-called harvesting map that has been developed in the Netherlands. And this creates more transparency about what materials are expected to become available when for reuse. So, for example, architects and construction companies can try to reclaim those materials and use them in new construction projects. And the, on the right side, you see a site that has been developed as part of the Interact Northwest Europe project, FCRBE which gives an overview of all the dealers that offer uh, reclaimed materials in Belgium, uh, France, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. So this creates a lot of transparency about what becomes available when. 
Now, this is also an interesting project. Uh, this is a project in which we have been involved in from Delft University of Technology and in which uh, a large French housing association, Paris Habitat, owning like over hundreds of thousands of dwellings in, in Paris, actually developed its own material exchange platforms. And you can imagine that in a large housing association like that, uh, a lot of materials uh, are being taken out of certain dwellings as part of refurbishment projects. And if the materials are still in a good state, they offer them on their own site. So they can be used, for example, in other dwellings or construction projects, uh, which is very interesting. And nice also that they also show on the site, they monitor how much waste has been prevented and how much carbon emissions have been avoided by actually reusing all the materials that are offered on the site. So material exchange platforms, good, but there are some things that still need to be developed. Um, overall, they have a quite a low level of maturity. Uh, if you look at, for example, the site that has been developed by FCRBE, it gives access to the dealers that offer the materials, but they do not directly give access to the materials that are available, uh, like on what you would have like on eBay, for example. Um, and if you have these material exchange platforms, although the platforms themselves are digital, you still often need a lot of storage space to temporarily store all the materials that you have taken out, for example, of demolition projects before they are actually being bought by other users. Standardization of information, that's also an issue. Um, often architects do not get the information they want on these material exchange platforms because, for example, they do not give enough data on the, the construction strength of the materials or on the building physical aspects uh, of, for example, window stills and windows. You know, what kind of energy value what do they have? And uh, overall, there's also a lack of efficient search engines. So. It takes architects quite a lot of time to find what they need. And there are probably some other drawbacks as well. So good, but still a lot to develop. Now, there's also an alternative. Um, if you look at the, the, the very simplified way to express the supply chain or the value chain in, uh, in construction industry, uh, it starts with the architect making plans and then a construction contractor actually carries out the plans, constructs the building, and it's uh, transferred to an owner and a user. And at the end, uh, at a certain point, buildings will be taken apart by the demolition contractor, the current linear system. If you reason from closing loops, it actually starts with the demolition contractor, who knows what kind of materials will become available when they get the assignment to take a building apart. And if this demolition contract is then partnered quite early with architects, the architects can already design with these materials that uh, become available. And then of course it has to be assembled again and transferred to the next use. Now in the Netherlands, there's a lot of experimenting going on with this, you could say more direct approach of, uh, of uh, reclaiming materials. And a nice example is this, former uh, office of the province of uh, Gelderland, the province in the Netherlands, in which a building that actually was not designed for disassembly was still taken apart, disassembled by a demolition contractor, Lagemaat BV, uh, in, into little pieces, which were then collected on a construction site for a new building. So here you see, in a way, all the, uh, the created Lego blocks, so to say, which you could uh, assemble a new building with. And they, in the very early stage, uh, made a BIM model already of the old building, so they knew exactly what kinds of materials would become available, with what kind of quality, size, etc. And they transferred this uh, BIM model to an architect, status that projects, who then made a BIM model out of it for a new building using 
a lot of the old elements that uh, become available. Um, so this is quite a straightforward way, actually, of closing loops. And it has some advantages over the material exchange platforms. Uh, one of them is that it maximizes reuse. In the design I just showed you, over 90% of the old materials are used in the new building. Uh, they have shorter storage time because you know uh, what will become available when and also when you're going to start construction of the new building. And very important, you have easy information access because the partners are directly cooperating with each other. So also a very good uh, solution supported by digital technologies, but still also in this case, of course, some challenges. You still need temporary shortage. It's very difficult to literally translate uh, one thing from the demolition site to the new site uh, where the new building is constructed. You know, there's, there's all sorts of logistics involved, so you really need temporary storage still, but shorter perhaps than with the material exchange platforms. Uh, you need a lot of quality testing still. So, for example, these concrete uh, slabs that became available, they were tested again for their strength and Interestingly, they actually found out the old uh, concrete uh, floor slabs were stronger than they used to be in the beginning. So apparently the concrete still hardens a bit while it's in use. Uh, and you need a lot of uh, information exchange protocols because actually I showed you the two BIM models, but because the demolition company was not aware of the protocols that architects use in their BIM models, the BIM model had to be made again. And it would, of course, be easier if they used the same protocols. And it leads to a lot of redesign. Because sometimes you don't know if, for example, these facade elements that came out of the old building, if they, do, if they still comply with building physics standards. So you may even have to take them apart to put in some extra insulation. And upscaling. So, and this is, I think, where the material exchange platforms and the BIM-based cooperation come together. Uh, in the Netherlands, we now have a marketplace also in a very primary stage in which whole buildings are offered to be deconstructed and then so they can be used to uh, yeah, to make new designs for new construction projects. Uh, with. So in the end, I think both material exchange platforms and the BIM-based corporation are both very useful for uh, closing the material loops. And ideally, they should be combined. And digital technologies are definitely a facilitating factor. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we now have a question session. I can see my um, for the questions from the audience, and also we will take questions from the uh, online audience through text if we have any. Any questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. But 
uh, you are trying to do it in the future. No? Okay. Uh, I will... Yeah, that, that, that's what it is. Thank you. So a reversible building uh, is um, a term which I use to, to set up the door to understand what the performance of certain buildings and certain materials should be. And once you want to assess the performance of something, then you first have kind of zero make, do making if you call it in the Netherlands, without um, zero uh, level. Um, uh, from from which you start measuring the performance of uh, of your product or building. So you will define the ideal solution, and then you start measuring how your products, buildings, uh, meet the ideal situation. So uh, therefore, this approach helps not only to design new buildings, but as I showed in my uh, slides examples of uh, assessing the reversibility and reuse potential of materials in existing buildings. So all the indicators which are defined as design um, indicators to design spectral buildings and design reversible buildings are also integrated into a tool which is a reversible build tool. Um, and this uh, tool automatically assess the reuse potential of materials in existing buildings. Also, the transformation capacity tool, which I mentioned, is a tool which helps designers to design future buildings as high uh, transformer, transformative buildings, as future uh, flexible modules, as I put circular buildings. Uh, so that's message to the students to start to try to design flexible modules for designing new buildings. But this tool is also used to assess the transformation capacity of existing buildings. Um, and the examples I, I showed when we've done the, the uh, um, digital assessment of uh, numerous buildings in Europe, as I mentioned, the uh, Luxembourg, we've done Luxembourg Station, which was built in the uh, beginning of the 20th century, um, the, the block in Paris uh, next to the Garden Road Station, um, built in the 19th century, the housing in France, in Lille, from 70s, 1970, uh, Roman Museum in the Netherlands from 70s, offices from the 80s. So what we've done with these buildings, we have scanned them with 3D scanners through, and, and also used drones to understand and an infrared, uh, infrared um, scanning uh, techniques, um, and then created a big reversible bin based on these point cloud files and data we, we got from the projects. And uh, it uh, used the plugin, uh, which is uh, which analyzed the dependencies between elements in a building, but in a digital way, it's doing a very fast session uh, in order to um, create a uh, kind of profile and define the use capacity of these materials. So the tool is being used um, for the assessment of existing building stock. What we are also talking about now is to do the quick scan of the cities, quick transformation scan of the cities in order to understand the future value of existing building stock using transformation capacity, using the spatial reversibility that I was uh, mentioning as part of the reversible building concept. So the reversible building concept is just kind of ideal uh, line um, identifying what circular building is actually about in order to understand better how to measure its performance, whether it's a design solution on the paper, or it's a building that has been built already. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Zambis, for the presentation. Uh, actually, I have a question that I can ask you, Mr. Emma, and uh, for uh, Mr. Ekman, and also Jason, if that means you can hear me or not. Uh, every construction sector professional, the architect that is 
Thank you. Well, it requires a very special client to make a decision for a reuse material. And in fact, if the client really started with the idea of having a green building certification, which is a high goal uh, or a very special certification or get funding in some cases, then it's possible. But the commercial you know, clients that want to quickly build themselves it's very difficult. Also, uh, I have uh, experience with uh, some project we found uh, from a demolished building uh, timber, uh, but there was a problem with logistics. And even though we were looking for reused timber on the project, uh, it wasn't possible due to logistics at the cost. You know, there are some practical issues. Just to add on that, uh... Legislation is something if you have to look at the paper and that you lot uh, in, in your environment uh, evidence. Um, and before really coming to the norm, if we have a governmental view norms, um, how we build and what kind of materials we use in, in, in it, CO2 reduction is also something which has been introduced to Scandinavian countries coming in the Netherlands as well, um, which will push uh, uh, reuse materials in your buildings. But we have done already a couple of uh, projects with, uh, with cities, with uh, local governments, like the uh, Roman Museum, which I showed, which has been scanned and was building, has been created. But then, uh, just as Vincent uh, was talking about another project, uh, um, they have shared and was building with architects, and they have used and reused on site a couple of key, key elements. Then we, we shared the use potential assessments uh, of materials from, uh, from the first building with the with city. Uh, and uh, in their procurement strategy, they introduced this, uh, the request uh, to uh, reuse um, at least uh, the materials which have high these reuse potential score of 0, 08 and 0, 09. So it has become their demand in the procurement strategy. And we see that coming more and more really first from the local governments trying to push this uh, agenda forward and also discussions in their game, for example, are going on in this direction. Alternate materials, about the buildings. When it's reused, you don't know the source of the time, especially if it's from a very old building. You know, asbestos become an issue. If it's timber, is it from Chernobyl? You know, all these kinds of things are preventing these reused materials to go further. Just one more thing. Another trend that uh, are a very optimistic about is um, working with industry. I, I work a lot with industry on daily basis on developing new new systems, local systems, but also helping them understand the, the value of their products and bringing it back into the market. So um, Janssen, I mentioned a couple of times, they, they are a steel company uh, producing steel facade systems. They exist for a long time and they come across um, their their facade uh, systems very often, which were uh, installed in the 70s uh, or 80s. I showed one example in my presentation. So I shared with them the BIM objects, as I was talking about. So they had to uh, integrate the BIM objects to their sales catalog. And we worked on that, uh, as we speak, on uh, improving this interaction between this uh, reversible BIM, BIM objects outputs for the manufacturers. Who are then bringing, bringing it up to, to the market to make lights. I see also uh, in, in the industry that they are also pushing very much in understanding the quality of their materials and what, what the value of these materials for them will be when they cut them, to bring them back. As a module that we will be installing in four, four weeks, a housing module where we made agreement with the uh, with company which is uh, producing module that they will be responsible for the whole module during the use and when we don't need it at, at the testing site like five years time. 
um, and by designing and detailing, that's where design became a very important uh, aspect of understanding the financial model and design and the finance and quality. By uh, convincing the, the, the industry that the details uh, as such, that they can very easily bring their system back into their original, their original standard once they bring it back into the factory, so without lots of labor um, and lots of effort, then they recognize that they do not have to put, invest a lot into that uh, material to bring it back into the market. And then they recognize the best value of the product and they can talk about some real or good financial uh, benefits for them. One last addition, uh, it's like materials platform, how it is important. We need physical material warehouses that people really send their materials to be reused. And when the time comes, it's easy to go and pick it up, like a shelf, you know, like picking up from a shelf. Because it's impossible to do it at the moment that you want, even if it's available. And the question was directed also to Facebook. Would you like to ask to that question? Maybe I to... Yes, that the question that was asked also was directed to you about the uh, use of the materials, how we can convince the users yeah. to uh, purchase the reuse materials and to use in their construction. So this yeah. is a little plan we can explain. People are hesitating to use the second hand construction materials. Yeah. yeah. I think what, what Alma also pointed out is that if you don't really know the source of the materials, it's more difficult to trust them. So that's, I think, that's also one of the advantages of the direct cooperation between the demolition company and the architect, because they actually know the source then. And if they need additional information about the material, they know where to get it, either from the demolition company or, as I showed the example, sometimes you just have to do some additional testing. And now, actually, if you get it, the data from those tests, uh, those tests, and they will be done more often, then, for example, uh, for these concrete floor slabs, you know that if you get the same concrete floor slabs from a similar building, uh, from a similar time period, then you can trust the material as well. But of course, uh, uh, the, the, this market has to become way more mature till we all get gather that kind of uh, data. So that's important. But it's also important to benchmark what you can build with reclaimed materials against what you would create if you would build a building with totally new materials. So, for example, also this demolition company and this architect, they measure what is the environmental impact of using the reclaimed materials, and they compare that with the environmental impact of using new materials. And you can actually see quite quickly that it's it's has much less negative impact on the environment if you use the reclaimed materials. If the and they, you can also do the same for the cost. Um, the, the cost of producing new materials can sometimes be higher than just taking materials out of an existing building in a smart way and then uh, making that part of a new uh, business proposal, business case. So again, you can show that you can, with lower costs and with lower environmental hazards, build something really nice out of, out of reclaimed materials. In the end, every building uh, has to comply with building standards anyway. So you cannot get away with, uh, you know, building like a, a crappy shed and calling it an office. Uh, so there are some uh, uh, safeties in the system as well. Uh, but yeah, trust remains an issue. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, you were speaking about rapid village line. Uh, Alisa, I just, Alisa, uh, Mia, yeah, I want to ask one question regarding your presentation. You basically focus on the data driven design in your presentation. 
but we were mainly discussing about the architecture profession. How is the profession really ready to deal with the data science and data driven design? This is a question of the educators from Cardiff to Istanbul we were discussing because we are not really educating our architects with this subject. So um, today, this afternoon, we have a long presentation that will emphasize that the scientists uh, from ITU, how architects should be involved in the data management. So what do you think that your presentation and your work as an artist forward thinking really, but how much is the professional really ready to manage this uh, design and the management of the construction? Thank you for the question. I'm just going to start and then pass on to Mia because she's a much in a much better position. Uh, how is the profession ready to take this uh, awesomely educated uh, computational designers uh, among you guys there in the audience and and some of the the universities uh, across Europe and the world? Uh, I think that uh, 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 you know I have a long view, uh, so it has been uh, uh, not not very uh, uh, good at it i think that uh, uh, we are uh, in in the past uh, 20 20 30 years uh, i think uh, in the past uh, as in my diagram you know as uh, uh, sustainable environmental requirements will tighten uh, I think uh, Vincent was talking about uh, um, the fact that we have to comply with building standards. Uh, we actually created the building standards and we have to adapt, adapt the building standards to comply with the 2030 and 2050. Uh, otherwise, uh, there is a real mess. And, uh, and so uh, I think that uh, we are I'm hopeful uh, that the profession, uh, the, the standards are, are not the standards. The requirements are, are getting tighter. Uh, at the moment, we see that the companies are ahead of governments. So, uh, you know, for reputational reasons, companies are running ahead of, uh, of the governments, which is uh, very sad to see. Uh, the, uh, the, I think that the profession is, uh, I mean, there's the opportunity for us uh, to go to transition to circular and uh, um uh, and uh, and we know and digital uh, data driven it is uh, really uh, um, uh, you know it is the best uh, is the best opportunity that we have if we have to design and make decisions for a different uh, uh, result uh, then uh, then i think that uh, that the the, so the stu those students those candidates that are educated uh, have been educated actually uh, you and i have been educated in this area for 30 years ago will have a better chance mia what do you think yeah i think that um the nature of the problems that we are being asked as designers uh people in the built environment to resolve are slightly ch shifting so if you take the example of, for example, reducing carbon on your project, you simply cannot improve what you cannot measure. And to be able to measure, you need to be data literate. So you need to understand the um, systems. Um, you need to understand how to interpret that data, how to read it, how to produce insights. And these are not specifically qualitative insights. So they have we have seen um, recently a shift in uh, the skills that are required to be able to interpret and resolve these problems. So I think in my case, I was very quickly oriented um, and I have pivoted to more technological roles um, that have required me to upskill myself in the field of uh, data science, especially spatial data science. So I think um, the, the the transition is obvious as more and more architects are exposed to uh, AI as well. We've seen chat GPT, we've seen all these um, technologies. They're no longer just buzzwords. They are actual tools that help us on a day to day. And so we need to either lead and, and continue to upskill ourselves or then we are left behind. And so there is a massive shift in the industry. Um, I highly encourage anyone uh, to uh, take some courses to continuously learn uh, about data, uh, specific data problem, data driven problems. Um, and there are tons of like interesting courses and material out there. 
within uh, the boundaries of the university or even uh, online. You can take courses. You can you can always, um, in a way, you're a student for life. So it's it's always about uh, recognizing that you will always have these um, uh, this gap in the skills that are needed in order to uh, be able to keep up with the competition, keep up with, uh, you know, continuously answering the problems um, at scale, I would say. Um, yeah. Thank you, Birgule. And I want to do a, a very practical thing is uh, if you guys uh, are uh, uh, struggling to uh, do, uh, to put in practice what you have learned uh, in Istanbul, please uh, let us know and we will try and uh, and mediate with your uh, uh, with your professionals that are struggling to, to appreciate uh, uh, the application of this. So um, I've done that uh, uh, over and over and over again in the years and I'm always one of the things that I enjoy uh, the most. Uh, I would like to thank all our speakers for joining us today for this important discussion for our, uh, in our profession that is going to have a tremendous accelerated change in the next five to 25 years. We will have a totally different remark and practice in our uh, profession for sure. So now uh, we are going to have to break for 10 minutes, 15 minutes.